When I started my journey, my research journey, this was back in 1991, I supported euthanasia. I thought that, ethically speaking, if you have a patient who suffers a great deal, and uh, suppose that she has cancer, and it's, it's something that uh, cannot be remedied, there's no medicine for that. And uh, the physician come and say, well, you also have gangrene in your leg. I would probably say that uh, the doctor should help her. I don't see much point in amputating the leg in that condition. Um, and I think that it will be better, the, the patient will be better off if she can assemble her loved ones around her bed and say farewell to everybody and determine the time of her death. This was my preliminary thoughts about these issues. And uh, then I started to, read, uh, to write for my book, The Right to Die with Dignity. It was published in 2001. It was a long journey. Um, and when I was starting writing the book, it was very clear to me that I cannot write a book about end of life without actually going there, without actually going to then the only place on earth that had euthanasia. It was not in law, but everyone knew that it's, it's done, and it was condoned. This is Netherlands, Holland. And I came to Netherlands, I got in touch with, before then with uh, 30 people who are the pushers and movers of euthanasia in the country. Those who drafted the law, those who sit in the ethics committee, those who wrote the reports for the government, those who euthanize patients. People whom I knew through their writings. About 30, as I said. And I went to interview them. I want to see uh, what's going on from them, not from reading. And from the moment go, you know, from the very first interview, I understood their problems. Uh, because many, many things that are not reported in the literature were revealed to me to the interviews. And these were major concerns. I entered in what uh, psychology is known as uh, cognitive dissonance because for eight years I was pro euthanasia. Mm -hmm. I wrote articles in favor of euthanasia. Mm -hmm. I came to euthanasia as a proponent of euthanasia. But confronted with the reality, confronted with what I heard, I was asking myself very penetrating questions whether I still believe in euthanasia. Because there's one thing to believe in something, philosophically, ethically, that is abstract. And quite a different thing when you are coming to apply policy. Because policy, actually, people can die. And I would say that because you're talking about end of, end of life issues, you must be very, very pedantic and concerned and careful about what's going, what's going on. Belgium started very curiously because in the Netherlands, we know the history. We know that the first case of today started around 69, 1969. Um, and then there was a quite a prolonged period of time in which there was no law, but even in the absence of law, there was what they call overmacht, meaning overriding principles that you not be, you as a doctor, you're not going to be criminalized by performing euthanasia because of necessity, because it was necessary to end the life. And different guidelines were provided by the KMNG, the Royal Dutch Medical Association, and so on. So it was a prolonged time. And then in 2002, they passed the law. But there was a time of reflection, and uh, you know, there was a experience. With Belgium, the history is unknown. We actually do not know for how long euthanasia has been practiced. There were no reports. And they were pushed into action in a, some sort of a, of a frenzy. Uh, there was no prolonged period of reflection in the public opinion about this. They complete the entire thing in six months. The legislation process within six months. Uh, it was not clear what the public actually wanted, what the medical association actually wanted. It was more or less a political act. So we are lacking all this knowledge that the Dutch provided us. And now they, they provide, uh, every two years they provide uh, reports. And their reports are not very encouraging. And there are many, many problems in enforcing this law. Now, because Belgium, for me, it was my second station. It was after I did my research about Netherlands, research, everything that was written and so on. Uh, so I came, I would say, with 
a strong opinion against euthanasia, given what I've seen in the Netherlands. So I cannot say that I was very supportive of what's going on in Belgium, especially because they are lacking all the experience of the Dutch, and the Dutch are, you know, I thought there is abuse there. I saw abuse. Mm -hmm. I heard of abuse. Mm -hmm. So I was very, very uh, hesitant about the Belgium from the start. And the material that I provided with, which without the Belgium are, um, are not encouraging, mm -hmm. to say the least. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan, I'm not a supporter. Um, but it, it seems that there's something intoxicating about this thing. Because once they're starting this motion, um, all the barriers are removed along the way and they push the, the envelope, you know, sure. one after the other. So, um, recently, that's the topic that I'm going to speak about later today. Uh, they've been euthanizing people who are tired of life. Mm -hmm. What does it mean, tired of life? Being tired of life is not a reason to die. Mm -hmm. I find staggering that this is now what the Belgians are doing. You know, people are tired. Suppose someone is going to be separated from his girlfriend. He's 16. First love. You know, the 24 hours to live together for the past six months. Deeply in love. And she separated him. And he comes to the doctor and said, I'm tired of life. Is this a reason to be euthanized? I mean, I've had staggering. Um, and because they don't have any qualifications about, you know, unbearable, physical, psychological suffering. And they are not careful in this phrasing, in the phraseology. It can, people can be put to death far um, prematurely than, than should be. And now that they are going to finalize this, uh, they are going to push the envelope and then to kill apparently. I just heard a lecture about this. The mental patient. All over the world, dementia is a problem. But all over the, the world, people don't kill these patients. Mm -hmm. We understand that these people need more care, not a little syringe. That's not a solution. Mm -hmm. It's very quick, it's very easy, it's less time consuming, and of course, very efficient in terms of resources. It doesn't cost much to utilize someone. Mm -hmm. It costs far more if you have to dedicate a, a, a team of workers caregivers to take care of the patient for 10 years. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. It's very quick. It's very easy. But is this the right solution? No, I don't think so. And all this in the background, when we know, because these reports, these biannual reports that are produced all the time, show us that many, many physicians do not actually report euthanasia. So they have severe problems in the monitoring systems. They're not working as they should. And we're talking about end-of-life issues. There's nothing more sacred than life. So it's, the monitoring system is not working properly. People are not advising what they're doing. They have problems in consultancy because they have to ask for a second opinion. And often uh, the second opinion is not clear. Maybe it's a friend of the doctor. Maybe it's not somebody that's independent of the doctor. It's not really autonomous. Maybe they're working in the same clinic. Maybe they have some sort of agreement, you are going to utilize my patients, I'm going to utilize your patients. Mm -hmm. But there's no public discussions about very problematic uh, phenomena that is now emerging in the past five years, mm -hmm. which is terminal sedation. That does not require any consent of the patient. The patient is admitted to the hospital, and because she suffers from cancer, then the doctor decides to put her on sedatives, and then if the doctor decides, or the medical team decides, that uh, this life is not worth living, the patient will die. And there's no consent, nobody asks the patient. Oftentimes, nobody tells the family they're not informed. They just smoothly goes into death. They call it terminal sedation. Mm -hmm. And we know also of cases in which there are cases where patients were euthanized without a consent. Terminal sedation is different from euthanasia because it's a gradual process, it's not a little syringe. So in terms of, you know, the process, the technical process is different. The end result is very similar. But in both cases, when you utilize patient without consent or you put them smoothly into terminal sedation, you know, process, you kill them. Mm -hmm. And I find it problematic because the law speaks about autonomy of the patient. What happens to the autonomy of the patient? Suddenly mm -hmm. it's just faded away mm -hmm. and it's the doctor who makes all the decisions. So it's very paternalistic in essence, mm -hmm. but they are waving the flag of patient's autonomy. Mm -hmm. Well, address the issues first. Mm 